everyone, I'm Susan Weiner. I'm a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator, and I'd like to welcome you to this edition of Facebook Live, where we'll be discussing the connection between diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and chronic kidney disease. Lucky for me, today I'm joined by Dr. Jonathan Winston, who is a nephrologist or kidney doctor, and Dr. Stacy Rosen, who is a cardiologist or someone who specializes in heart and cardiovascular issues, and both of whom are experts in their respective fields. Thank you both so much for joining us today. People with diabetes may have an increased risk of heart disease and chronic kidney disease. The good news is through healthy eating, exercise, and other lifestyle changes, there are a number of positive ways to keep up with your heart and kidney health. Today, we are going to learn more about the link between diabetes, heart disease, and kidney disease, so you can take some small yet very positive steps to protect your heart and kidneys and still manage your diabetes. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that this program is being held in conjunction with the National Kidney Foundation, Diabetes Sisters, and Women Heart, the National Coalition for Women with Heart Disease. So let's jump right into our discussion. Dr. Winston, can you define the healthy kidney and what kidney disease really means? Sure. We have, generally, we have two kidneys. Some people are only born with one kidney. Some people donate a kidney. Some people receive a kidney. One kidney is enough to have kidney health. But the kidneys are very, uh, are comprised of a very intricate bed of blood vessels, microscopic blood vessels, all of which act as one unit to filter blood and remove waste products from the blood. So a normal kidney will do that normally, and your doctors can check for that kidney health parameters by blood and urine tests. Kidney disease, the most common cause being diabetes, is when the kidneys just aren't excreting waste products as efficiently as they should. And there are many stages or scales, but clearly why we're here is to discuss or avoid the worst form of kidney disease, which is kidney failure, which is uh, an inability of the kidneys to maintain health, and, the, and then one would need dialysis. And there's a continuum of kidney disease leading from normal kidney function to kidney failure. And we want to avoid any kidney disease, but certainly kidney failure. Thank you, that was such a thorough explanation. And Dr. Rosen, what is a healthy heart versus heart disease? That's a good question. The heart is a pump at the end of the day, and its primary job is to pump blood to the other vital organs, kidneys, lungs, brain. Mm -hmm. And the blood vessels that feed the heart muscle are involved in keeping its, the heart muscle healthy. Right. So there are all forms of heart disease, including heart attacks or angina, heart failure, rhythm disturbances that can cause palpitations. But at the end, the overlap between diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease often has to do with the damage that elevated blood sugar, abnormal cholesterol, and unmanaged high blood pressure can have on the blood vessels. Oh, that's very, very interesting. Dr. Winston, can you please talk about the interplay between having diabetes, having heart disease, and having kidney disease? The, the normal healthy kidneys are dependent on vascular health. As I said before, the kidneys are an intricate web of microscopic blood vessels. Diabetes and high blood pressure both cause changes in small blood vessels. They get thicker, uh, stiffer, uh, and narrower. So blood flow to any organ is reduced when you have the side effects of high blood pressure or diabetes. So together, uh, having diabetes and hypertension poses a big risk on kidney health and, of course, on heart health. Well, so they really do amplify each other when we have all of the diseases, the heart disease, the kidney disease, and diabetes together. Dr. Rosen, what are some of the consequences of having unchecked diabetes and unchecked blood pressure if someone is not monitoring their values? That's an important question because 80% of heart disease is preventable. And it's preventable by knowing some important numbers. Mm -hmm. Some of them include your blood sugar, 
uh, being aware if you have abnormal blood sugar and managing it, lowering it, knowing about your cholesterol level and reducing it when possible, and knowing your blood pressure and managing it appropriately. All three of those numbers are things that each one of us could know, mm -hmm. very personalized, and manage with the help of clinicians to be sure that we've optimized those three to minimize risk to our blood vessels and the heart function. Very interesting point. I don't think that some people really understand what a cholesterol value is and what a triglyceride value is. Can you speak more on that? Absolutely. Triglycerides are one component, but if you think of total cholesterol in general, the major components that we all talk about is the LDL, which is the low density lipoproteins. We want those to be low. Those are the bad mm -hmm. cholesterol. HDL, high densities, we want to be good. And triglyceride is the third component in a traditional total cholesterol panel. Each of those may have a different impact. Interestingly, in the past, we didn't realize how important triglyceride levels were. Mm -hmm. At one time, we thought that this wasn't as bad when it's elevated as the other types of cholesterol. We now know, particularly for the diabetic patient or for those with renal insufficiency, kidney dysfunction, watching the triglyceride and monitoring it and appropriately treating it is very important. And what can somebody do to lower their cholesterol and their triglyceride levels? Absolutely. The most important thing actually is knowing. Mm -hmm. And there's too many people yes. who don't know their mm -hmm. numbers. And then it's looking at lifestyle changes, food choices, uh, weight management. And it's not an all or none. As little as a small amount of weight changes, some small changes in the foods we choose, moving a little bit more can have a huge impact. Of course, there are some individuals who need medication mm -hmm. to manage these optimally. All these small lifestyle changes lead up to a big impact on our health. And we don't always have to do everything at once. One small change at a time makes a huge impact. Dr. Winston, can you talk about, following up on the blood pressure discussion, how blood pressure or high blood pressure affects the kidneys? Yeah, the blood pressure is a major determinant on how healthy our kidneys can be maintained over time. So high blood pressure damages small blood vessels. Uh, if, there are, if small blood vessels are exposed to high blood pressure for years, these blood vessels don't get destroyed, but they get injured and they react to that injury. And that reaction usually takes place by them getting narrower, thicker, with uh, uh, simply less room to move blood through them. And that's what the kidney do, is supposed to do. The healthy kidney is supposed to take blood, filter it, get rid of waste products. When those blood vessels are diseased by either high blood pressure or diabetes, it, they can't do that, and that's called kidney disease. What can somebody do in terms of lifestyle to improve their blood pressure? Uh, several things. One is try to be at your ideal weight by exercising, staying fit. Uh, be careful about the foods you eat. Dietary salt is a big culprit in terms of blood pressure, so we should be on a, a limited salt intake. Uh, and also uh, alcohol. Avoid excessive amounts of alcohol. And uh, be careful about how much foods you are eating that are rich in bad fatty acids or cholesterol. So it's exercise, alcohol, uh, weight reduction, salt intake, cholesterol intake. And of course, quit smoking. And, and, and I was going to bring that up <laughs> as given. well. An absolute given. Absolutely. Dr. Rosen, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think we've seen a lot of interesting new data about the importance of sleep as well, and yes. we are a, com a country that does not. We brag about not sleeping, and we think it's a badge of honor. But the truth, sleep hygiene and having adequate sleep great has been shown to have effects as well. On, on or everything, including our stress Absolutely. management, including stress management. That's a very, very good point also. And turning off our technology sometimes mm. in the evening does help us sleep better. That's for sure. So looking at this great background that you both talked about, as a diabetes educator, I can share that 99% of diabetes care is self-care. People with diabetes need to take care of themselves. They're not always with their wonderful clinicians and may not always have support. 
Dr. Winston, what do you suggest people do in a positive way to help manage some of the expectations that they may be hearing from us as healthcare providers? So they're not, because diabetes is overwhelming, to feel a little bit overwhelmed in their daily care. I think patients or individuals really should be doing what we said before. You need to know your numbers. You need to understand what the goals are, be it for blood pressure, for cholesterol, for diabetes. And once you know your numbers, you discuss those with your doctor or healthcare provider and come up with a target. Where should they be? And what's a reasonable rate to get there? And then there are these lifestyle changes that we discussed that you can uh, embrace. And I think the challenge is to embrace it. It shouldn't be that we're in food prison. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be that if you didn't exercise today, you've done something terrible. Mm -hmm. But it's just as a matter of your outlook that you are in control. Knowledge is king. And you need to take that and embrace it and do the best you can and be in touch with your educator and your physician and see how uh, we, you are going forward. For most of the things we're talking about, it's not an overnight fix. You can't be really good, excuse me, really good in March and <laughs> jump, fall off the curve in February. It's got to be a lifestyle modification and slow but steady will win this race. Almost getting rid of the words good and bad. Oh, and yeah. I saw Dr. W Dr. Rosen just going like this. I want you to follow up sure. <laughs> on how not to use a judgmental approach with the people that we work with and incorporating. Um, they are the head of their own health care, as I said. So you could follow up on that. Absolutely. I think we have all in the healthcare world switched from a disease prevention process to a health enhancement model mm -hmm. where we partner with our patients, our, our, you know, our communities, to really identify and optimize ways to stay healthy as opposed to don't do this, don't do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think it's very important that we you know, dismiss the all or none principle. So some of the food choices don't have to be perfect. Exercising does not mean running the New York City Marathon Unless you want year. to. Unless, That's always my line. Unless yes. you want to. But, but it means every time you have an opportunity to walk rather than taking an elevator, mm -hmm. every food choice that's a little smarter than an alternate is the way to go. And actually being proud of continuously trying Absolutely. to make the right decisions. And in terms of providers, people with diabetes can seek other providers if the communication you have with your current provider is not really working for you. Dr. Winston, what do you think about that, people searching beyond maybe who their current healthcare team is? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would like to think that as a, as a community, physicians are embracing the challenges of better health, but I do acknowledge at the same time that many physicians really the, the, the interaction between a patient and a physician is short. There are certain realities. Yes. It's short. It's perhaps too focused on disease mm -hmm. and not focused enough on life. Uh, but I think the patient needs to be their own advocate. They need to ask questions. Uh, and uh, they need to really know what the issues are. What's the di what diagnosis, doctor, do you have for me? And what can I do to better myself? And I have to add from the diabetes educator standpoint, no matter how long a person has had diabetes, it's great to ask, tell me about your diabetes journey. Mm -hmm. Tell me where you are now because diabetes burnout when it comes to heart disease and to kidney disease is a very, very real thing. It's a very real thing no matter where you are along the continuum in your care. Um, Let's go back to the cholesterol piece for a minute and just looking at the different parts of it that you mentioned. Can you talk about modifiable versus not mod modifiable risk factors when it comes to heart disease and to some of those lipid levels or blood fat levels? Oh, absolutely, because the beauty is most of your risk factors for cardiovascular or heart disease are modifiable. So your cholesterol level is modifiable. Managing your blood pressure, it doesn't mean that you won't have hypertension or elevated blood pressures, but they can be managed. The truth is the only non-modifiable is your family history. We can't change that, but it's important to know it. Your age and gender, mm -hmm. because 
um, as we age, our risk for heart disease goes up. But pretty much everything else, moving more, cholesterol, blood sugar, um, weight, is all something that is in our control. And doesn't a woman experience different symptoms of heart disease and of a heart attack than a man? Yes, and that's very important. Historically, the medical community didn't think that heart disease was a woman's illness. But ever since 1985, more women die every year of heart disease than men. Wow. And part of the challenge is that women don't necessarily have the, what we call typical, an elephant sitting on my chest kind of pain. They may just feel some breathlessness or fatigue, something that most of us experience every day. So it's something that we may not even be aware of, and that's very much a real thing, and, and the symptoms are different than what we typically hear that a man might have. Do those symptoms change if somebody has diabetes? Yes, that's a wonderful question, because some of the damage that diabetes does to blood vessels and to nerves may make individuals less likely to have oh. discomfort in the chest at all. And really? in the cardiology world, we treat diabetics uh, almost in a special class, even if they don't have have known kidney disease or heart disease yet, we know that their risk is so high if the blood sugar isn't maintained at optimal levels that we are very aggressive with diabetics. Interesting. And Dr. Winston, do you have anything to add to that? No, I agree completely and the same with kidney disease. We know that diabetes is the number one cause of kidney disease in the industrialized world, certainly in the United States. And uh, all diabetics should be screened for kidney disease by blood tests and urine tests. There are medication that you should be on, even if you have the mm. most mm -hmm. minimal abnormalities of kidney function and you're a diabetic. And uh, we've actually, as a community, as a country, we've made great strides in not curing diabetic kidney disease, but slowing the progression. There's a lot of research going on. There are a lot of clinical trials going on. And we're very hopeful that with a little more time, hopefully just a little more time, we'll find something that really can improve kidney function in people who already have kidney disease from diabetes. Right now, uh, a lot of it needs to come from the patient, the relationship between the patient and the doctor early identification, medication when necessary, and lifestyle modification. And a lot of this from the point of providers as excellent as the two of you are in your field is communication and language and making sure that the questions that we're asking upon assessment and upon follow-up allow the person who's coming in to see us to share what some of their concerns are and to not feel judged so that they can share the information um, of what's going on in their current world and in their current life. I'd like to follow up a little bit about that, the medication issue. How about people with pre-diabetes who may have kidney disease and heart disease, but we'll start with kidney disease. So if, you, uh, if you have pre-diabetes and you have kidney disease, you, you're, the, the two are probably, may not be related. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say probably, they may not be related. So that needs to be separated. Uh, most people who have diabetic kidney disease have had diabetes for some time, and the kidney disease is a side effect or a complication of having diabetes. So pre-diabetes is essentially a metabolic state where you don't quite meet criteria for diabetes, but you're showing some signs that you might and you should get certain treatment. Kidney disease and